Welcome to WDB lecture number five, since apparently we're zero indexing. So we are starting from zero and going up to five, and we are at five right now. Um, so let's go ahead and start sharing screen, and we can get started. OK, this lecture will be more fun. It isn't necessarily your traditional stack lecture, like uh, JavaScript or CSS or uh, HTML, but it is, uh, in a sense, how we're going to learn about the very, very fundamental basics of how the internet works in general and like how the internet uh, is operating in our modern day society or modern day architecture. Um, so in terms of an agenda, like I said, we're going to figure out how the internet works and get into very uh, basic networking stuff, uh, aka CS168. I'm going to go ahead and introduce project two. And then after I introduce project two, I'm going to go delve deeper into the front end versus back end split and how to choose which uh, branch that you're going to do. So that is our agenda. And again, this is a very chill lecture because you already learned the tools of the trade, like HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You know how the entire house works from its fundamental building blocks to everything from electrical to um, plumbing. So again, yeah, this isn't necessarily a tool of how to do web development, but rather how web development is even possible in the first place. So first, internet basics and massive credits to CS168, where I ripped a lot of this content directly, um, which does a very good job at explaining what the internet is. Um, so to start, what even is the internet? Um, is it how Facebook works? Is it how cloud services work? Like, is it AWS or GCP or Azure? Or is it the entire application system, like Facebook, Google, and Amazon built together? Um, does anybody have any idea of what the hell the internet even is? And yes, I, I'm reaching out to you, dear viewer. What What is the internet? Go ahead and say it out loud or comment it in Twitch chat. I mean, Zoom chat. <laughs> Absolutely poggers. I feel like Dora the Explorer right now. All of them, maybe, maybe. However, the, the current version of the internet that we're going to try and think of is rather how computing devices communicate with each other. So yes, it does encompass of how Facebook works or how AWS or GCP work. Also, I just realized I spelled GCP wrong, but that is OK, because fuck Google. Um, and we also understand how the application system works, but they only operate because of how computing devices communicate in the first place and the basic architecture that allows these devices to communicate or, and the certain protocols that allow them to communicate. For example, TCP, IP, BGP, OSPF. And you don't have to know what those terms are. They're just examples of protocols of how these devices actually communicate. Moving on from that, let's start off with these computing devices, right? You have your pacemaker, which is technically a computing device, your car navigator slash GPS, you have your Mac laptop, your iPads, your Windows PCs, all of this stuff. And you're trying to figure out how these things communicate, right? Um, one of the first steps in con uh, connecting this hardware together is to introduce switches, right? So hubs, basically, in order to connect specific networks together. So for example, we could have three networks here that are connected um, in a certain way. And to define these connections, we have these cables. For example, um, I am connected on Ethernet. There is a cable running from my laptop, this thing right here, all the way to my modem. And then there is a cable from my modem to whatever um, Comcast does, which is apparently really bad. Um, and then from what Comcast does or what Google does, there are fibers that connect these switches together. And these are like optical fibers that like shoot, like use light in order to transmit data. Really cool stuff. If you want to learn more about the cool stuff, I think EE 264 has it, or 267, I don't know, something like that. Uh, you could totally Google that. But yes, that is how these interconnected webs start actually binding together. And as you can see here, um, these webs are known as your internet service providers. So for example, I have a very garbage internet service provider whose name is Comcast. Um, and then that internet service provider is in turn connected to other uh, service providers. For example, Google can have their own network connected to whatever UCB is using or to whatever AT&T is using and so on and so forth. It isn't just limited to these three domains or services. The internet encompasses literally 
all of them, which is absolutely poggers, if you ask me. So moving on from that, internet is infrastructure in that we have this giant, <laughs> you're not supposed to see that. You have this giant web of information flowing back and forth from all of these nodes. How exactly does data get from one point, which is your end host, to another? And that is essentially what the next step is going to be. How does data know where it's going to go? We have this massive network that does a lot of cool stuff and there's a lot of edges connecting things together. And if you've taken CS70, this is just a massive graph with like millions or even billions of nodes and billions of edges. So how do you navigate this uh, thing? And that is where protocols are used. They are the GPS for the internet. It's a specification of how messages are structured, right? How they are sent and how they're received. They're kind of like how I'm delivering information from me to you right now. It's like a conversation. Who is talking? When do they talk? How do you respond from a certain prompt? It, and it's something that EX majors really struggle with, but that's okay um, since this is networking, not necessarily day-to-day -day conversation, right? So in terms of protocols, we have this uh, giant web, like I said before. We have your Facebook server, your WoW server, you have your World of Warcraft client, you have your Facebook client, and so on and so forth. And the protocol actually determines how uh, you navigate this web. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty details of what packets are or like what headers are being used or how everything is routed, but just know that these protocols make these things happen. So depending on what kind of headers that a packet has or what kind of information is being transferred or how a packet is encrypted or decrypted, it determines largely how it's routed through this forest. That is the same slide. Okay, so in terms of protocols, here is an example. Let's say that Alice is trying to communicate to Bob in this giant network. And we write up some code while you're doing stuff, you set up a message and then you send the message. And then Bob is over here just chilling on the other side of the net network uh, while something is happening, receive that message. How exactly are we gonna actually communicate this? It looks really simple in code. In fact, you could say that this is Python um, through its simplest definition, but of course networks are more complicated than that, right? So here's one example. We can model our protocol like a standard conversation. Alice says hello, then Bob says hello, and then Alice is like, give me cs.berkeley.edu, and then Bob is like, here is cs.berkeley.edu, and it's very simple. However, does anybody know any potential pitfalls that this kind of protocol can have? And again, just type it into Twitch chat, just say it out loud. I'm not gonna bite. Not secure. That is also one thing. It is not secure. So anybody can see Alice tell Bob hello. And if it's something more sensitive, like your CS70 midterm or your LaTeX files, then that's something that we may not necessarily want. That's a good one. Is there anything else that could be wrong with just this protocol? That is totally okay. Um, one thing to consider is that what if Alice sends hello and the hello fails, right? So for example, I'm on Comcast. Let's pretend I'm Alice right now. And I'm asking Bob over Comcast, hello. Comcast is a very shitty ISP. And because Comcast is a shitty ISP, my hello might not actually make it to Bob. So if I send the initial hello to Bob, Bob might not actually receive that message. And therefore, Bob might not actually be able to say hello back. And then I might not be able to send, uh, give me cs.berkeley.edu. So this sort of protocol has issues that if you have one singular point of failure, the entire chain collapses. So for example, if Bob doesn't say hello back to me, I'm just like, wow, Bob really just ghosted me in this moment. What the hell, Bob? Or for example, I don't send uh, cs.berkeley.edu and Bob says hello. Then Bob just creeped out because Alice is saying hello and not saying anything back. So it's like this singular point of failure that won't necessarily make this protocol work. Here is an alternate protocol. Alice says hello and then spams Bob <laughs> with give me a cs.berkeley.edu. Now, going back to this specific protocol, um, our hello is no longer just one thing. We spam Bob with multiple messages, which means that as soon as one message connects, then hopefully Bob should send cs.berkeley.edu. Now, the same question applies. What's something wrong with this type of protocol?
Yes, it's not guaranteed that Bob, Bob will respond. Exactly. So if you send hello or if you send give me cs.berkeley.edu, you don't have that handshake that says Bob. For example, let's say that cs.berkeley.edu is very private information. Like, let's say Alice is from Stanford, right? Like, why would a Stanford student be asking for Berkeley information? Um, Bob can um, figure out that, oh, Alice is from Stanford, therefore I'm not going to send you that message. But Bob doesn't know what to respond in that situation. Um, will Bob just ghost Alice? That's not very uh, polite. Or is there a specific protocol for Bob to say, hey, you're from Stanford? Hell no. Or again, like, um, let's say the initial hello doesn't actually pop into Bob's, Bob's DMs, right? The first message is just cs.berkeley.edu. Um, Bob doesn't know whether or not to trust Alice or whether or not to send this information back. Another thing to consider is, let's say that Bob gets every single one of these DMs and responds to every single one of these requests. Not only is Bob going to get flooded by these requests, Alice is going to be flooded by these requests back. So in this specific protocol, Alice asks one, two, three, four, five, six different times to give me cs.berkeley.edu. Alice will get seven, will get cs.berkeley.edu six times back. So that's not something that Alice would necessarily want. So protocol design is extremely important so that you could circumnavigate these types of problems from just thinking of simple protocols. So again, pr good protocol design is extremely hard. And with that vein of reasoning, there is no such thing as a perfect protocol. Each protocol has its own pros and cons and different kinds of use cases and when to use them. So that begs the question, which protocols do we use and which protocols are better? And I kind of just answered that question. No protocol is necessarily better. Um, it's necessarily what kind of use case are you going to use this protocol for? So with that discussion of protocols, we can get into how the internet in general is architected in the first place, right? So first we'll deal with a spaghetti architecture. There's different kinds of network designs. There's different kinds of hardware. And like I said before, there's different kinds of protocols. And through whatever means necessary, the internet needs to be able to tie all of these things together. So I may be complaining about my shitty ISP, which is Comcast, by the way, don't do Comcast. Um, and then there could be a different ISP called Sonic, which is leagues better from Comcast, which I wish I bought in the first place. How exactly do these two different architectures mesh together? And how exactly do they co uh, cooperate in this massive architecture that we call the internet? Also, I just read Twitch chat. Yes, Isabel, she deserved the spam for spamming Bob back. Exactly. Also, I will read that article later some more. But yes, first off, the internet is federated. So despite these differences, the internet still works, right? Google still needs to connect to Berkeley. Go Berkeley still needs to connect to Stanford. Stanford still needs to connect to whatever things and so on and so forth, right? So competing networks still need to cooperate. So if one thing, even though all of these ISPs are competing for overall network supremacy, they still need to work together in that if Comcast goes down and nobody knows how or why Comcast goes down, the internet still needs to live another day. In addition to that, the internet is fucking massive, right? There are 3.8 billion users on the internet every single day, which is 51% of the world's population. And in my opinion, 49% to, uh, we still have 49% to go. In addition to that, there are 1.24 trillion unique web pages, and this is still growing. Um, 6,000 tweets are generated, 40,000 Google queries are queried, 2 million emails are sent every single second. So the internet needs to be able to handle this, this massive um, input and output of data going through its entire network, which is why we say it is fucking massive. In addition to that, the internet is dynamic, right? So you need different kinds of technologies to work. So shitty Comcast has a very outdated uh, technology versus Sonic, which has very new technology, or Google, which has cutting edge technology. And again, there are different kinds of endpoints and different kinds of applications in which this technology meshes together. So again, the application usage is also diverse. The internet is used not only to send tweets or send emails, but also to send medical data or perhaps to host medical data. Another thing that the internet could be used for is to make sure that uh, banks' transactions actually post and go through. 
Um, there are different kinds of endpoints. Like I said before, there's my iPad, there's this computer, there's your computer, there's somebody's pacemaker, which is connected to the internet. And also there are different kinds of users. So there's just the general users like me and you, there's uh, medical scientists that need to use the internet. There are professors that need to use the internet. And something important to also consider is that there are hackers trying to use the internet, right? So you need to be able to figure out a way to host all of these people in such a way that doesn't crash the entire system. Moving on, the internet is asynchronous. If everything were to happen one after the other, the internet would break. And this is going back to our previous, uh, our second previous slide, right? The internet is massive. So let's say that 6,000 tweets are generated every single second, and we process these 6,000 tweets one after the other. Even if tweets take one one thousandth of a second to process, it takes one whole second to generate all of these tweets, right? And that may not seem bad, but then like, you have to consider what if we process all 40,000 of these Google queries in order, or all two million of these email sendings in order. The internet would not be able to handle that if it does it one after the other, so everything needs to happen in parallel with each other, right? In addition to that, lots of things are happening at the same time. So not only are you sending tweets, you're sending emails, you're sending medical data, you're receiving medical data, and so on and so forth. And in addition to that, feedback always takes time to get to the end. Whether it's a 1,000 second delay, or one second delay, or a 1, 1,000 second of delay, communication is always dated. Also, I need to exit out of Slack, because this is getting extremely annoying. Where is my Slack button? Wait, where is Slack? Oh, there it is. Quit. Beautiful. Okay. That's better. Okay. So communication is always dated. You need to add a timestamp to your communications so that a server understands when the request happened. For example, uh, going back to our previous case of Alice just spamming Bob, uh, Bob receives all of these requests, but another thing that Bob receives is when these requests were given. So one request could be from a year ago, another could be from six months ago, and another could be like 20 seconds ago. Bob needs to understand which request to respond to because some requests are just too old to, to navigate through. In addition to that, the internet sucks a lot. There is lots of points of failure, whether that's software, switches, networks, links, modems, hackers, messing around with the internet, um, Comcast not being able to deliver my packets. So, there's a lot of points of failure. And here's the statistics. If 50 components work 99% of the time, that still means that there's roughly a 40% chance of complete failure. So the internet needs to be able to handle this, right? So you have failure at scale. You need to ha handle how to deal with this. Going back to Alice spamming Bob's DMs, not all of those packets are gonna make it to Bob. Or even our first network protocol, where it's just a simple conversation. If the first hello never makes it to Bob, Bob will never respond. So we have to develop these kinds of protocols and this kind of architecture such that we know exactly what's going to happen at all times. We know, hey, we receive a bunch of these DMs. Let's just respond to the latest DM. Or for example, let's send a request three times. And if, three time, and if after three times it doesn't handshake, then we'll try a different, uh, we'll try a different methodology. And once more, the internet is still evolving. Moore's law, the rate of, or I think the exact wording of Moore's law is that the number of transistors in a chip will double every 18 months. And a more general case of Moore's law is that technology, uh, the power of technology gets better every 18 months or every year and a half. So technology is always evolving. Why wouldn't the internet not evolve with it, right? And you cannot design for a fixed target because if you design for such a fixed target, then the internet, then technology is going to evolve past that and then suddenly you're outdated. And again, this goes back to our very first point is that in that the internet is federated, right? We need a way such that the internet will be able to handle not only the really old systems, but the cutting edge new systems as well. So to recap about the internet, it is federated, massive, dynamic, asynchronous, sucks, and is still evolving. And they're all design considerations that weren't into how the internet is working at this such a scale. Now, what the hell does this have to do with web dev? 
And just like how we have these simple, simple tenets of the internet, we have these simple tenets of web development as well. So that means that your web apps are federated, massive, dynamic, asynchronous stuff, and so evolving. And though I don't necessarily have slides for all of these, I can go over them one by one, right? So in terms of federated, your, inner, your web apps need to be able to accept input from anybody anywhere. So somebody from their iPhone 10 or a new iPhone 12, or perhaps a MacBook Pro or a Linux machine needs to be able to access your web apps and those web apps just need to work. This is also similar for different kinds of browsers at, um, accessing your web apps. So whether you're or not you're connecting from Chrome or Firefox, Internet Explorer doesn't count and neither does Edge, you need to be able to serve uh, them this data and have it look good on that data. Your web apps need to be massive. And this doesn't necessarily mean you need to write a lot of code or you need to make a lot of pages. Your websites just need to be able to serve a massive amount of people at the same time. So for example, um, you have a really poppin' website called webatberkeley.org, right? You need to serve a lot of people, for example, not just the Berkeley community, but the Stanford community to show them just how much they suck. In addition to that, to show other people all around the, all around the nation, hey, we're Web at Berkeley, here's the cool stuff we do. So we need to be able to delegate this data, not only to a small subset of individuals, but to potentially millions upon billions of users. Also, our web apps need to be dynamic, right? We want our web apps such that it will work on any kind of use case, whether it's your iPhone, uh, your laptop, and so on and so forth. In addition to that, um, maybe not to a lesser to extent, but your uh, web apps need to be asynchronous. So in terms of being asynchronous, um, your web apps need to be able to handle a lot of data and not crash. So you need to be able to handle lots of requests in a very smart and efficient manner. You can't just do the naive solution, which is requesting one piece of data after the other. You need to be able to delegate all of these things all at once. Your web apps don't suck, though. <laughs> I should have probably qualified that statement. Um, so in terms of your web apps suck, that is not true. Your web apps need to not suck. Um, and another way to look at that is that your web apps need to be able to handle different kinds of points of failure, right? So, for example, if one portion of your web app goes down, you need to be able to tell the user, hey, this part of our web app went down, let's redirect you to a 404 and say that our code monkeys are working on it in a different kind of case. And again, your web apps are still evolving. If once you get into our back end and front end tracks, you'll realize that there are new kinds of web development frameworks being released every one to two years or even six to eight months, right? So React could be the hottest thing right now, but if you look for forward five to 10 years, React will look antiquated and outdated. So you need to still like learn that new kinds of technologies are still coming and develop your web apps to account for the new these new technologies. And one thing that I want to show you is not grade scope, but rather spacejam.com. This is a website from 1996 that is based purely on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it looks antiquated as fuck, right? So in terms of like looking at a time machine from 24 years back into the past, this is the latest and greatest in terms of web development technology. Um, if your web apps do not change with the times, then you will look like, an, this. your websites will look like an antiquated piece of history just like spacejam.com and though space jam was an amazing movie its website sadly has not stood the test of time so yeah that is the bare basics of internet 101 and again though there isn't necessarily anything concrete uh that we learned just the general idea of the internet i hope that uh you at least learned something from this very quick and dirty presentation if you want to learn more, again, these were stolen directly from CS168, which is a really, really cool class. So later on in your web development journey, if networking and internet is calling to you, go ahead and take CS168. Um, now that we have gotten past that, for legal purposes, you know, boy, anyways. <laughs> anyways, that is internet 101. Now let's go on ahead to project number two. So project number two is a very, very simple, has a very simple design doc. In fact, I don't even think we have a design doc for project two. For project two, we want you to build this thing, your very basic 
calculator. Now you have CSS and HTML as your forefront for your calculator, but then we introduce JavaScript to give your calculator functionality. So for example, nine times nine, I have no idea what that is. I'm an each major. I let Python do everything for me. Oh, this calculator tells me it is 81. Or if you divide by six, what the hell is that? Oh, it's just 13.5. Or divide by three, it is 4.5. So this is project number two. Um, it is assigned right here, right now. And it is due on uh, October 24th. So you will have one and a half weeks to do this. I forget what time it was due. I believe 1124. Um, but this is uh, what we want our calculator to be. And according to Samarth, we actually do have a spec, which is good to know. Also, uh, there is another homework that will be released very soon. Um, it is your JavaScript homework that will be also due on the 24th. So for both of these assignments, we will have one and a half weeks to do it. So let's hop onto our basic stack and onto our project two spec. There we go, project time. This is what we're gonna develop. So we're gonna make it even hotter by stealing what Apple does, right? So it's going to be the basic uh, Apple cal calculator interface. Again, there is a project example here, which I assume looks like the actual calculator, yeah? So six times six, 36, beautiful, we know it works. So requirements, the calculator should look like the above image. So using your HTML and CSS chops, make it look exactly like this from font to borders to tabling, everything needs to look the same. And, uh, aside from that, it should function like a normal calculator. So if you do six times six, you should get 36 and not 12. So all of the operations should work. You don't need to implement the modulo operation or the uh, decimal operation. Um, just assume everything's gonna be an integer and we'll leave it as that. Uh, the C means clear. So when you click it, it should clear everything from the first state. So it should not be able to save state. So if you do C and do C again, you can't go back to your previous um, things to make things, uh, your previous equations to make things simpler on you. Um, in addition to that, the back arrow is apparently extra credit. Um, why the hell we have extra credit? Who knows, but it is there for you to do, right? So- That's a typo, <laughs> uh, my bad. <laughs> Thank you, Samar. So. Um, it is not extra credit. Is it just credit, Samar? Yeah, it, it just it just is. <laughs> Never mind. You are required. I will fix that. Your your back arrow is credit, not extra credit. <laughs> very cool. Very nice. Uh, don't worry if the number is too long for the screen. So yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> And calculators tend to have some special behavior when you hit equals. Um, if you type a number, it just erases and starts over, but feel free to, uh, like Samar, treat it normally and make it like a C if they want to clear it. Let's just keep it simple. We also have our HTML and CSS tips and tricks. So if you want to go over that, go ho ahead and go over that. We also have some JavaScript tips and tricks. So again, if you want to go over that, then you're go ahead and go over that. Um, I will emphasize that. Uh, the most important thing I believe is if you are writing 200 plus lines of code, um, please don't write 200 plus lines of code. Um, this is a very simple calculator. We don't want you to do like any cool linear algebra stuff. Uh, this isn't a graphing calculator either. So um, let's try to keep it uh, as simple as possible. So yes, any questions with this project spec? Okay, very cool, very nice, very swag. Oh, um, according to Samarth, implement NumPy for extra credit. And if you want even more extra credit, uh, implement it in C. Not C++, just regular C, okay. Um, with that said, let's go ahead and jump into what we're gonna do next week, which is split into our front end and our back end facts. So I'll let Samarth take it away with front end. Go ahead and do your thing. All right, y'all, what is up? Uh, we're still recording this, right? Okay, good. So for front end, um, some of you may have heard magical words, front and back end. I personally did not know what the hell the distinction was for a long time when a second semester freshman year. So 
yeah, it was definitely after I started learning web dev. So before I go into what we'll be doing in the front end track, I'll just explain what front end is. I did kind of explain this during the info session, but in case you didn't come, front end is basically everything you can see. So everything you're seeing now in front of you, Zoom, that's Zoom's front end. Everything that the back end does is kind of logic. So the fact that I'm able to see you in real time is back end, but the fact that I'm able to see you in this configuration or gallery view or webinar view or anything like that is front end. Like front end is basically, if you think about Facebook, most of Facebook is front end. Of course, you have a database and you might have some AI here and there. I don't know what they're doing, but most of Facebook is front end, from posting to customer, not customer, to meeting friends, to messaging. It's a perfect example of what front end is. So what we'll be teaching in the front end branch is primarily React is a huge part of front end. It's, I know Urban mentioned frameworks. It is the hottest framework right now. And it is honestly here to stay. It's been around for a couple of years, probably stay around for at least five to six years. So it's a solid bet to learn. It's definitely the most popular at the very least. So even if it doesn't survive for 10 years, it'll survive the longest and you can't work on stuff that doesn't exist yet. So we will teach you React. It's also really, it's a really fun dev experience once you're used to it. It's a really great language. I love it. Um, we'll also go into TypeScript, which is just type check React. It's just fancy React for smart people. And you're all smart people because you're in this club. Um, we will then go into UI UX, which is super important, especially as a front developer, because you're working with everything that people see. It's important that what you see doesn't burn your eyeballs out. So we'll be teaching three lessons on UI UX, uh, teaching Adobe Illustrator, Figma, and design principles. So it's going to be super fun. Timon and Vicky, our head of designs, will be teaching that, and it'll be a good time. Learning Figma is, after I learned Figma, Figma is my best friend now. I can make anything in Figma so fast. It's beautiful. I love, I love Figma so much. Next, we'll be teaching SAS, which is just a CSS preprocessor. It's a way to write CSS, let's just say, twice as fast. Have you ever wanted to nest CSS, like nest classes within classes? Well, SAS does that. And that's pretty much it. But it's beautiful. Um, and then we will go into a couple of weeks of backend, just to make sure you guys are all full stack engineers. We'll teach you guys Node.js, AWS, and REST APIs, just the basic stuff. Maybe even databases if we're feeling especially spicy. And just as a last thing, we'll be teaching um, React Native, which is kind of like React. It's React, but for mobile applications. It's like spicy or React. Actually, no, it's just stupid or React. React Native is not as fun as React, but it does work on mobile applications. So we are also going to be teaching you mobile dev, which is just web dev, but just not as good. Not as good. And I'll hand it to Irvin for backend. Yes, that, that, that'd be it. That do be it. Good call. You're muted. I just realized my dumb ass is muted, but that is okay. But like, yes, we're bringing it back to our info session. Oh, you're going to learn about React, UX, UI, uh, TypeScript, SAS. Um, and these are all the companies that use that. Um, but what about backend? And this is where, where all the magic happens, okay? Like, you can make hot websites, right? You can make really, like Facebook. I mean, eh, eh, eh. but like, let's say that you- Like the web dev website. But yeah, the web development website is a hot website, okay? Um, but what gives this website functionality? The back end. That's what the back end does. So, for example, um, if you're at Facebook and you remove all of the back end engineers, Facebook will crash. It will, it will just not work anymore. Um, so you get to learn about how we get to make Facebook work, essentially, how we're deploying websites. So you get to understand how we're hosting w, WDB's website uh, currently. You get to learn about things like Node.js, my passion. So Node.js is essentially just very fancy JavaScript that could interact with files. Um, next up, you'll learn Django. And Django is like Node, except in Python. So hopefully something extremely familiar to you, um, especially if you've taken or are taking CS61A. You're going to learn about API development, so REST APIs, for example. Um, what the hell does that mean? Well, join backend and find out. Um, in addition to that, we get to learn about very, very um, basic AWS cloud um, microservices. So cloud is, by Eric Bachman's words, um, the future, okay? And everything is moving towards the future or moving towards cloud. So I believe it is very worth it to learn about some AWS in order in the web dev space to figure out what we can do to make our web development lives easier in terms of the back end. 
Um, don't forget to apply to WDB. Um, our QR code is on the bottom right. Um, and hopefully we'll accept you. But yes, uh, that is what the back end is going to teach you all about. One quick pitch for back end. If you've ever wondered how to get the actual front end code you write, like the website for, you made for project one onto an actual domain and how that works, let me tell you, the process is really annoying and really confusing and it sucks until you use cloud, in which case it's drag and drop. So back end is way, e so the back end that we teach, especially with cloud, makes your lives way easier than learning back end or the traditional more front end track. I also want to qualify one of my statements. I said that if you go to Facebook and remove all the backend engineers, Facebook will not work. Well, if you go the converse way, if you go to Facebook and remove all of the front end engineers, then Facebook will be a buggy mess that's extremely difficult to use, like MySpace. So they're both equally important. They're just important in different kinds of ways. Moving Without front end, your computer would just be the terminal, meaning by that way. Okay, so uh, one last thing before we round off this uh, quick and dirty lecture is if you want to tell us uh, which uh, track that you're going to go into. So Samarth has made a Google form, but quite frankly, I couldn't find it. So, I'll just send it in the chat right now. Give me a second. Okay, yeah, send it in the chat. But another easy way, you don't have necessarily have to deal with the Google form, but we have two different um, tr uh, Slack channels. We have hashtag backend and hashtag frontend. So if you want to go into our backend or front end track, go ahead and join a uh, hashtag backend or hashtag uh, education front end. In addition to that, uh, Ansa, to answer your question, uh, these lectures will supersede these current lectures. So if you look at the CLAC calendar, which I will pull up right now. If you look at the CLAC calendar, um, you will see that uh, and if you move on from the CLAC calendar, you will see that we no longer have uh, the specific uh, education type. You mean, you mean WDB calendar? Yeah, oh yeah. If you look at the WDB calendar, and okay, actually, I should hide all of these calendars. That's probably a good idea. <laughs> but if you look at the WDB calendar, then you can see that you do have these uh, education lectures from the past three weeks. However, they are no longer here in the weeks moving forward. And this is where the uh, when to meet uh, comes into play. We want as many people in each track to attend the lecture as possible. So when you fill out that when to meet, we will create uh, new lecture times to uh, hopefully um, give the most amount of people a chance to attend a live lecture. So that is why that is a thing. So join either education front end or education back end, um, and we'll have a very fun time. Also, just to say, this form is mandatory. It is not optional. It is mandatory. Actually, yeah, um, it is mandatory in that, like, if you want to join both, you totally can. But we need to figure out which track to grade you on, whether it's back end or front end. And to choose which track to grade you on, um, it will be this form that we will be using. But also, yeah. um, we answer for your question. Yeah, back end people will learn a week and a half of front end. So it's a week and a half of front end for back end people and a week and a half of back end for front end people. Yes, you will learn the simple, the, the very basics of both. But again, if you want to like watch both lectures, that's totally cool too. We're not going to stop you. I dropped the form link in the chat, by the way, if you guys want to fill it out. But yeah. Are there um, any questions? Um, wait, so when we're filling out the form, the one we indicate that we're the most interested in is the one that we get graded on? Yes. Yeah, the one we, um, we'll send out final assignments. I mean, everyone will get their first choice, but we'll just send out final assignments just to clarify with everyone what they're being graded on. Yeah, like you could, again, again you could send both, but we need to figure out what to grade you. And this will figure out what to grade you on. So I guess um, if you really don't have any preference, but would love to do both, then I guess choose five out of five for both. And if you would rather do one over the other, then uh, just rate that one higher. If there are no other questions, then I'm just going to say thank you for coming to uh, WDB lecture number five, since we're zero indexing. And uh, can I get a Go Bears, please? Go Bears, thank you. Go Bears!